our next presenter as remote viewer 001 from the Stargate program. This is Joe McMonagle. He became involved with Monroe, met Bob at least back in the 80s. I first met Joe in 1985 at my first gateway. And over the intervening 35, 36 years, I've been very privileged to participate in a variety of discussions, uh, talks, because he often comes to give nightly talks at gateways, guidelines, other programs. He will also come and hang out during the lunch breaks. And so for more informal talks that I have found just as informative and sometimes even more. Joe is currently training the remote viewing seminar which he has done some uh, rearranging, tweaking, upgrading. <clears throat> so if you're interested in remote viewing, that is certainly something that you want to take advantage of. Um, he worked with Bob Monroe uh, to solve another and tweak a number of things over the years. He's authored four books. I have all of them. Some of my copies are replacements because I had passed on the original to somebody else to make sure they read it. So there's plenty of material out there that um, Joe has made available and there are a number of TV appearances as well. So you can actually see him probably on YouTube and some other places if you look up these TV appearances. So with that, let me turn over um, the spotlight here to the original, the one and only Joe McMonagall. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be here to talk to you. Hello, world. <laughs> Sounds like the whole world's logged in out there. Uh, the talk I'm supposed to pre present today is about how I got into the, uh, into the Stargate program. It was kind of an interesting problem because when I originally came back from overseas, I'd been overseas probably 14 straight years, not quite, just about. And I had done six uh, hardship tours. That means uh, one. And uh, so when I came back to the headquarters, I didn't expect anything other than uh, some, some menial work there. And what happened is it was, a, was supposed to be a surprise. I got promoted to warrant officer, chief warrant officer at the headquarters, which uh, kind of stunned me. And I was put in charge of my MOS for the world, which is, I won't tell you, that's not a, a small job. Um, everything that uh, everybody was doing in terms of my MOS, my military occupational specialty, I was in charge of. That's uh, vehicles all the way to making sure that they were properly housed in their missions and everything else. Um, it was a considerable job, on top of which they sent me to uh, Fort Benjamin Harrison when I got there and uh, put me through the advanced course in, uh, in computer science because everything was going to computers. And I think that's why I got stuck with it. But in any event, I became the also the advisor to the commander, three-star general and the commander of the intelligence for the army, which was the AXI, the Army Chief of Staff for Intelligence at the Pentagon. In any event, I was expecting to stay in this job until I retired. And I suddenly got a call one day and it was somebody I didn't know, it was Skip Atwater. He was a first lieutenant at the time. And uh, he and another man, a major, asked me to come over to Fort Meade and they wanted to talk to me. So I went over there and what they did is they had a whole lot of information. A lot of it was classified and a lot of it was unclassified. And it ranged from newspaper articles on psychics to uh, very highly classified papers that the Russians had, uh, that we had gotten from the Russians and the Chinese and a number of other places on uh, psychic functioning. And they gave me a cup of coffee and sent me down at a table and put all these printed all this printed material in front of me and they said they wanted me to read it or look it look it over is what they said so I did and I spent about two hours doing that and uh, uh, after which they came in and asked me uh, what I thought of the material and I said uh, reading the material it 
it kind of turned me off actually i said i didn't believe in all this mumbo jumbo stuff but uh some of the papers i said were intriguing and they seem to be very threatening in terms of what they could or couldn't do and so my response was a formal one where i said that uh i didn't believe most of what i read but in terms of threat i thought it was a de definite threat against the country if it was used or targeted against americans and that uh, something should be done about it uh, they said thank you and gave me my coat and i left and i went back to the headquarters uh, a few weeks went by and i got a second call and went back to see uh, atwater and and watt the major and uh they both sat and talked to me for a while about the fact that they were going to see if they could identify the threat and work against it. They asked me how I would feel about that. I said, I think it's a great thing that you guys are going to do that. I said, I saw that as a personal risk because I knew it would be detrimental to their job. In other words, they probably would never see another promotion or they'd probably get thrown out of the army for doing it. And I left again. I uh, gave me my coat and I went back to the headquarters. Uh, I guess it was about four weeks went by and I got a call to come back over to Fort Meade, which I did. And I was uh, introduced to Russell Targ and uh, Hal Putoff. Both our Dr. Hal Putoff was from, uh, both of them were from the Stanford Research Institute. And they had been studying some of these papers and some of the material. And I was surprised to find out in a briefing that they had uh, something to do with uh, uh, the threat. But nobody would talk to us about what they were doing or how they were doing it. Uh, instead, what they did is, and there was, they brought everybody in at this particular point. There were, I think, 30 of us in the room, 32 of us in the room. And they said, everybody who uh, has a direct interest in this, raise your hand. And of course, uh, only about uh, 30, well, out of 30 people, only about uh, half the hands went up in the room. Uh, they asked those people to leave. They took their coats and they left. And then they uh, said, okay, everybody who's still in the room, if you plan on staying, you're going to get a briefing. And once you get the briefing, you can't leave. And once you get the briefing, you're committed. And anybody who doesn't want to be committed to knowing more about this material, leave now. And all but about 12 people left. And I was in the group that stayed. Uh, we were then interviewed one by one by Hal Putoff and Russell Targ. And in the interview, uh, Skip Atwater had my records in front of him. And in the file of my records, there was a brown envelope. A uh, small envelope it was about this big, and uh, it had a red stripe across it, and it said, "Only to be read by the commander of the Intelligence and Security Command. Do not open." And Skip Atwater tore it out of my file and ripped the end off and pulled all the papers out. In in the papers were uh, the medical records from my near death experience that I had had in Europe, and as a result. Uh, and I, I asked them not to read it, but they did. But as a result, uh, I spent quite a bit of time with Hal Putoff, uh, talking to him about the experiences I was having since my near death experience. And I was having near, I was having the out of bodies, the, the, uh, what you call an out of body. And I didn't know that's what it was called then, but I was having out of bodies and they were spontaneous. Uh, for many years after my near-death experience. And he explained what they were and why I was having them. And that gave me a great deal of relief. And uh, he asked me if I would be interested in studying the materials. And I said, sure. If you're going to do a research project, I'd be interested in it because I think that this stuff is a direct threat and we need to know more about it. So uh, I left after that particular meeting uh maybe less than three or four days went by and i got a call from uh the major and the major said you his exact words were you said everything everything the way it needed to be said 
you crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's and you have a appropriate, uh, not a negativity, but appropriate caution in approaching the material. So we'd like you to join our group. So I went over and got read in and there were, it turned out to be six of us that had joined this group and it was a part-time effort. We were supposed to do our normal jobs and on certain days go over and spend two or three or four hours with this group, uh, which I did. And during the times that we were doing the, the temporary uh, sort of getting together, uh, we what we were asked to do uh, was study all of the material and try to determine what was the most threatening or what was the most realistic. Uh, the material that we got from Stanford Research Institute seemed to be very realistic. Uh, so we talked about that. Uh, I don't think it was about a week and I got called back and asked if I would go to uh, Stanford on uh, temporary duty for about a, a week or uh, I think it was two weeks. So I went to Stanford for two weeks. And when I signed in at Stanford, they told me I couldn't talk to anyone about what I was doing. Uh, I said, okay, that's fine. Uh, and I found out that I was gonna be put through some experiments and the experiments had to do with uh, the outbounder program that they were constructing at Stanford. The outbounder program was essentially where they would have someone selected as an outbounder and that person would go to a safe and pull out uh, a random envelope. Uh, the envelope would have numbers on it, which would be generated by a random digit, digit or you know, a, a device that would produce a random list of numbers. They, you would go to the safe and pull out the matching envelope and then walk out and get in a car and the outbounder would drive away. And 20 minutes later, he would stop where, or she would stop wherever they were and they would uh, open the envelope and it would tell them, go to this place. It would be a place somewhere in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, once you get there, we want you to get out of your car and walk up and go into the building and interact in some way with whatever this place was. And they had everything in there from restaurants to bowling alleys to you name it. And at the time that they were known to be there, for 30 minutes, we would target them from a windowless sealed, shielded room in the uh, Stanford Research Building. That was on the third floor of the radio, uh, radio and physics building. So I would go up into the third room with Russell Targ and we would sit, I'd sit on a couch and we'd sit there with a camera and they would film me as I was describing where this outbounder was. Now, I remember the first, the very first target I did, um, I asked uh, Russell Targ, I said, so how am I supposed to do this, this thing you call remote viewing? And he said, all you do is you close your eyes and imagine where the person might be, and then just tell me, give me details about that location. In this particular case, I described a, a building somewhere. I was just getting imaginary thoughts and feelings about it. So I was putting those down on paper. At the end of which I collected quite a bit of material, I said, um, I think it probably looks a little like this. And I sketched the building from the materials that I had already produced. In other words, I took all the details and put them together and it, it kind of looked like a building. Um, when I got through, they uh, said, okay, now we have to wait until the outbounder comes back to find out where they went. And when the outbounder came back, I can't remember who the outbounder was at the time, but when they returned, they said, okay, I'm gonna take you back to the target or to the place that I was located. And it turns out that the building I had drawn, I said, had reminded me quite a bit of the, the uh, art, museum located on the Stanford uh, campus. We, uh, we drove across the, a lot of different areas from the, the lab, but we wound up at the Stanford uh, library and uh, 
and the back of the I thought we were going to go in the library, but we didn't. We came out of the building and went across and into the this field and walked over to the entry to the uh, the Stanford Art Museum. And it looked exactly like my sketch. And Russell Targ said, I remember he said, wow, you did a pretty good job on this one. And I said, I wonder how that happened. In my head, I was a little bit worried that something happened. I wasn't sure what it was. But I had drawn the building. It turned out I did over the course of two weeks, I did a series of six of these particular outbounder targets. Um, I remember one of the targets with Russell Targ was kind of it's kind of funny. I made him mad because he asked me, I described a building that looked a lot like a pillow. I said it looked a lot like a pillow, you know, shaped like a pillow. And uh, I said it was in the middle of piles of crystals. I said it's crystals everywhere, millions and millions of crystals, and everything was white. And he said, Oh, that's very interesting. He says, I don't remember a target like that anywhere in the San Francisco Bay Area. And then he said, I'm I'm not supposed to say that, I'm sure. But he said, I don't know where you are. And I said, uh, well, that's what I see. Millions and millions of crystals. Everything's white. And the, bu the building in the middle is nothing but a pillow looking thing. So he said, well, if everything's white, he said, there must be some other colors there. He said, can you tell me what the white is mixed with? in terms of color and I said yeah I'd say um it's uh there's some red and I said it's kind of a brownish red he said okay and I said no wait a minute um but it's white and he said okay and I said no it's red and he said you got to make up your mind Joe and I said well all I keep getting is like this red slash white and he said uh, I can't accept that. I need a color that I can put down here that's real. And I said, okay, it's red, white, slash, white, red. And he said, I can't do that. And I said, well, learn to live with it because that's the color. And he got really angry. And I said, I forced him to put it down. <laughs> and we waited for the outbounder. And where we wound up, we drove up to this place on the shore. And it was a place where they, uh, they, made salt from the uh the water of the ocean and uh the building it was piles and piles of white salt everywhere and the building in the middle of it was a quonset hut which looked a little bit like a pillow and the interesting part of it was russell went into this this strange look and he said your your color couldn't be more correct because the building was e enameled it was an enameled white building, but it was been there a long time. So rust was bleeding through the building color of white everywhere. And he said, that's a perfect description of the color of the building. So I thought that was a pretty interesting target. Uh, in any event, it turned out, I found out later, many, many moons later, that I was uh, the first one in the history of their project that had gotten five out of six first place matches on the, the targets. I had literally drawn what the targets were. And they were extremely excited about that. Well, I got back to the uh, to, to uh, the headquarters and when I arrived, uh, my desk was empty. And I said, what happened to the materials in my desk? And uh, they said, you're not working here anymore. Go see the general. So I went to the general and the general said, I. I've reassigned you to Fort Meade. You you have to go over there because you're in some, you're in a very important project. So I went over to Fort Meade, and it turned out that I had been sent over full time to the project called uh, at the time it was called Gondola Wish. Uh, that surprised me. Uh, I didn't really want to be assigned to that project because I was already sitting in the most pretty. Uh, prestigious project of my career, running my entire MOS for the world. Um, I had 28 stations, 2,500 people, uh, probably a billion point eight in uh, money, budget every year. 
I was developing million dollar systems and, and I really didn't want to go to the project, but I did consider it a threat and I thought it would be, it would, it would be wrong not to pursue it. So I started out with a project, but against my will. In the project, uh, what we did uh, initially is we had, uh, uh, we had some targets that were brought in. They were test targets, uh, but they were issues that had no answer. Uh, the targets that were brought in to us to uh, practice or perform our first efforts against were targets that had been unanswerable for a number of years. One in particular was a Russian, uh, I think it was a bear, bear bomber that had been tricked out to do intelligence collection and had gone down somewhere over Central Africa. Uh, Central Africa, of course, is the predominant area is the Congo, what they call the Congo. So it's heavily jungled, very difficult. There's no roads, very impassable in most places. And uh, there were three or four three or four people were targeted against the, uh, the bomber. What we did is we manufactured small circles. Most of us were given maps all individually. Uh, we weren't allowed to talk to one another. In fact, they the people that did the work on the, the plane were in four or five different locations in America. Anyway, we did the, uh, did the maps and we had lots of interlocking circles on the maps it turned out uh, they analyzed the locations and came up with a location that was uh, almost exactly mailed by a woman psychic in another state she had made a near perfect circle uh, directly over where the bomber turned out to be uh, they reported it to the authorities in uh, in the pentagon and they, what they did is they sent in a special forces unit, which had the rope in by helicopter because of the jungle. Uh, they weren't on the ground two minutes, and they started bumping into natives going down the trail, carrying parts and pieces of the bomber on their shoulder. They were stripping the bomber of metal to patch the leaks in the roofs of their huts. And uh, so we, we actually found the bomber had been missing for almost three years. It was, of course, turned back over to the Soviets at the time, uh, who thanked us for finding it for them. Or, you know, one of those kinds of things. Um, anyway, that was one of the targets. Another target we had was a missing uh, officer. He was a one-star general in Italy, and he had been kidnapped by the Rote Brigada, the Red Brigade. At the time, the Red Brigade were historically known for kidnapping people, collecting, collecting ransoms, and then uh, sending them back in separate boxes. Uh, we were very concerned about finding the general because the Red Brigade had a 12-hour head start after they had taken him, and there was no possibility, there was any possibility that he could be in either Western Bloc countries or Eastern Bloc countries. Um, I kept getting the word Padua, which uh, is the archaic name for a town called Ravenna in Italy. It turns out that Padua is also the town that he was kidnapped from. So because I kept saying Padua, they came up with the conclusion that since Joe's saying the archaic name, he must be held in the old part of the city. So they tried to match my drawings to some of the areas in the old parts of the city and found an area that was almost an exact match. There was another person that we were working with, a man named Hartley Trent. Hartley Trent was an ex-naval uh, naval man who had done uh, mostly analysis of overhead photographs his entire career. And he was retired from the Navy working as a civilian. Uh, partly Trent also said, uh, gave some descriptions of how they were holding him and what was going through his mind at the time. And they compiled all that information. And by the time it got to the Italian authorities, they had actually captured uh, the brother of one of the terrorists. 
the brother of the terrorist gave them information about a building that matched the building Hartley Trent had described. The building was sitting in my drawing. So they decided to raid that particular building, which they did. And they found him on the floor we said he'd be on, being held exactly as he was, we said he was being held. And so he was uh, recovered safely before they could do anything with him. And they captured the entire team that had taken him. So that became a fairly good uh, proof of the remote viewing, of the quality of the remote viewing. And there were some other things that were done. Um, I was able to describe a new submarine that the Russians were building. Um, when it, this was a target that the National Security Council had been looking at for almost two years. It was a building that had something being constructed in it. And they couldn't tell what was being constructed. Uh, but railroad cars and materials were going in one door and the cars were coming out empty in the other. Uh, their best hypothesis was that there was some new armored vehicle being produced. Uh, they never would accept the submarine idea because the building was not connected to water. The building was disconnected from the, the water. But my submarine... Uh, the guess that I had made about the submarine was actually taken to the National Security Council by a, an admiral. Uh, his name was Stewart, Admiral Stewart. When Admiral Stewart came back from there, he brought the materials back and he said they refused to accept them because they said they were total fantasy. And I was a little bit miffed by that. And Stewart actually noticed that. He said, I think I just made you mad ang and angry, Joe. And I said, what makes you think I'm angry? And he said, there's a red line going up the side of your neck. So I think you're probably a little bit ticked off. And I said, well, um, you can go back and tell them that this particular submarine will be launched in 104 days. That, you know, and I didn't say it that way. I said, go back and tell them the fantasy would be launched in 104 days. And so what Admiral Stewart did is on the way back, he went to the National Reconnaissance Office and had them set up some oversight on that particular place, that building at 102 days out, thinking that it would be close. It happens that when they did observe the building from up there, they observed the building uh, 104 days later or 106 days later, uh, they found a uh, brand new submarine sitting out in the harbor tied to a uh, Soviet, uh, any, uh, Soviet aircraft carrier. The particular so submarine that they saw was huge. It was four times the size of the normal submarine. It was 90 feet across in width. It was uh, they had asked me when I did the remote viewing how long I thought it was, and I said, I think it's about 30 feet shy of the length of a Soviet aircraft carrier. The fact that it was tied up to the Soviet aircraft carrier was not lost on many people because they could measure and they knew the size of the aircraft carrier, and it was 33 feet shy of the length of the aircraft carrier. Uh, we took a lot of pictures, really good pictures of the submarine. It's the first time in history that they were able to gather uh, photographic evidence of the Soviet boomer class submarines. Uh, it turns out that they produced nine of these. They're called Typhoons, Typhoon class submarines now. That's the a acronym we gave them or the name we gave them. And uh, none of the others were ever seen when they were made and launched, by the way. So it turns out that uh, that became well known throughout a lot of places. In fact, years after the the wall came down in uh, Berlin, I I actually went to Russia and met the head of their particular psychic unit. And while I was there, I had coffee with the head of the Red Army. That's equivalent to their to our five star. And while we were having coffee together. He told me the reason that he wanted to 
to meet me and have coffee was because I was an American and I knew more about his submarine than he did. He's the head of the Red Army and he, he took him six years to find out they had a submarine like that. He said, I knew about it before it was launched. <laughs> so he wanted me to sign a book for him, which I did. Um, in any event, it was a real surprise to everybody that, that, that it wasn't a fantasy. So as a result, they decided, Congress decided to give more money to the project. And we went, uh, we went full, full uh, time uh, as a collection uh, unit. And the first name of that collection unit, because we went from a study unit to a collection unit, we lost the name, uh, uh, we lost the original name and we became uh, uh, Grill Flame. Uh, Grill Flame, that lasted until President Carter gave a, a, an interview to some people and talked to some news, news people, the news people. Uh, and they asked where he had gotten the information from that allowed them to find the bomber. And he said, we got it from our psychics. He happened to be holding a green folder in his arm here with a red stripe across it. And it said Grill Flame on it. So we lost the name Grill Flame. And we got renamed Center Lane and everything got moved around and changed. <laughs> uh, so we were Center Lane for a while. And then we became too important for the small, uh, the small people that were running it. That's the Army Intelligence. It was taken over by the Defense Intelligence Agency, which was the center for handling all intelligence for America. And when it got taken over by DIA, uh, the name changed from uh, Center Lane to uh, Sun Street. So. When we became Sunstreak, is about the time that I came up on my retirement. I had been a member of the project for almost uh, six, six years, six and a half years. And so when I retired, uh, I retired from the project and was hired by Stanford Research Institute to come to California or to do work here in Virginia for California, which I did. So I started doing remote viewing from here. Uh, I was attached to the uh, Stanford Research Institute until it was closed down in 1988. Um, I went from the Stanford Institute when I was uh, let go there. I was hired, I was let go one day and hired the next by the lab at, uh, at Science Applications International Corporation. They didn't, they didn't want to shut it down at Stanford, but some political problems erupted there. So they moved us to Science Applications International Corporation, which was uh, managed by the CIA. So if you, if you believe what the, what uh, the man said on uh, the interview after our project was outed, uh, that the CIA had no real interest in it, you'd be wrong because they, we did work for them for approximately 12 years. And 12 years produced results on over 260 targets for them. So I think it probably worked pretty well. Um, I worked there at Science Applications International Corporation till the project was formally closed down in, uh, in 1995. Uh, by then it was being run by the CIA and the Defense Intelligence Agency uh, when they, they decided to close the project because it was taking on too much heat. Nobody, politically, nobody wanted to be caught dead using psychics. And so as a result, they closed the project down. In that period of time, um, I did uh, something in the neighborhood of 300 targets, uh, probably close to 10,000 remote viewings. And in the last two years of the project was the only remote viewer. Uh, the previous five that I worked with all retired or left or died 
before uh, I retired, and I turned out to be the last re the last remaining target uh, handler, so to speak. So I was doing the remote viewing for two years alone for the entire project. As a result, I was having a lot of a lot of trouble with what I call my cool down. Uh, my cool down was where I went from one target to another target. Uh, usually I was doing somewhere like four to six targets a day, uh, 24 seven, seven days a week. And after a while you get a little bit tired. And so my cool down was taking longer and longer where I tried to empty out my mind from the target I had done previously, getting ready to do another target. And that cool down period was getting outwards to about an hour and 20 minutes, I guess, somewhere between an hour and an hour and 20 minutes. As a result, uh, Skip Atwater, the lieutenant who is now a captain, uh, brought me to the Monroe Institute and introduced me to Bob Monroe. That was in 1979, about 1979. Well, we talked the military into hiring Bob to try to help me with my cool down period. And they were secondarily interested in whether or not I could actually learn to control my out of bodies. They saw that as a probable secondary targeting me mechanism. Uh, so I came and I started coming to the Institute on a regular basis. Uh, I would come on long weekends for approximately 14 months. The long weekend, uh, basically, I would finish my remote viewings on a Thursday night. I would come to the Institute and uh, arrive here late Thursdays. And then starting Friday morning, I'd be in the lab with Bob until, until uh, Sunday night. And then I would get up about four o'clock on Monday and drive back to Fort Meade and start remote viewing again. So I was doing a lot of remote viewing back then and a lot of things with Bob Monroe. What we were able to accomplish using Hemisync in that period, um, in that particular period, um, Bob cut a, uh, back then we used tapes, so he cut a tape for me that was very, very similar to a 10 state tape. It just was tweaked a little bit for me. Um, look, make it a little more effective for me. And and so in that period, I was using that tape to do my cool downs. Uh, I'd listen to the tape and it was starting to reduce my cool downs from an hour, possibly an hour, down to uh, something like three to five minutes between remote viewings. Uh, that proved to be really effective at helping me de-stress from doing the many remote viewings I was doing back at Fort Meade. So uh, it worked extremely well for getting the mind right for doing a remote viewing. Uh, secondarily, we were effort trying to, he was trying to teach me to control my out of bodies, which turned out to be a hell of a job for him. And not so bad for me because I did a lot of sleeping in the in the black box. <laughs> um, I think Bob was getting frustrated with me, but eventually we were successful. I was able to control my out of bodies. Um, that was formally tested and proven to be uh, every bit as effective as anything else that I was doing. Um, somewhere in there. Uh, when they decided to shut the project down, uh, I decided that I would spend more time at the Institute, which I did. And I've been doing that ever since and uh, trying to train other people or at least share with other people what remote viewing is all about. Re remote viewing is not about uh, describing things in absolute detail. It's not about knowing what the target is. In fact, remote viewers should never know what the target is. If they if they target an automobile, then they should be able to give you all the details on an automobile and never know what it, what it is they're targeting. Uh, 
the reason why is because it's the details that are important. Uh, what the thing contains, how it operates, what it might do, the effectiveness of it, the operational strength of it, if it's easy to build, not easy to build. All these things become important intelligence uh, and intelligence knowledges. And you, you don't need to know what the object is to produce intelligence about it. Uh, so there's a mistaken a mistaken impression that remote viewing is about describing something in detail and getting to know what it is specifically. Uh, but that's not what, what remote viewing is all about at all. It's about producing details about something, uh, everything but knowing what it is. Uh, the person who does a remote viewing should not know what it is they're looking at because it keeps their mind open open to whatever the details might be. Um, I love the Institute. Uh, I believe that the true strength to remote viewing has nothing at all to do with the remote viewing, it has everything to do with the discipline of the mind. Uh, with a disciplined mind, you come to understand a whole lot more about reality, uh, what life is, uh, what it means, how, uh, what, where your place is in it, uh, what your strengths are, your weaknesses are. I think it it develops uh, a deeper a deeper understanding for who and what we are and why we're here. And so, remote viewing for me has always been a more of a character builder than not. And uh, so, I see it as something that's not not so much a weapon as it is a method for becoming better at being human. Uh, I could be wrong, but I doubt it. I have since spent numerous times in Russia with our opponents, with the people who develop their psychic abilities uh, and use them against us. It turns out that ours were profoundly better than theirs. Uh, and they were amazed at what we were capable of doing. I did a couple experiments with their top psychic while I was in Russia. And uh, they won't let us copy those experiments and bring them home. They were, they were scary to the Russians, I think. Um, we, we had a very big impact on them. As a result, uh, we've done uh, research in a number of places overseas. Uh, and uh, as far as I know, we're still doing research. Uh, we're now working with uh, two other countries in the development of remote viewing and uh, continuing to research remote viewing. Uh, we've published uh, four books on remote viewing that contain all of the science since the very beginning to present. Um, uh, it's about 1.8 million words. Uh, it's a huge histo history. Uh, so anybody that says remote viewing isn't real is lying through their teeth. They're not, they don't know anything about the science and they haven't done any reading of the background of the history. And that, uh, that pretty much has everything I want to say. I, I'm glad I, I'm glad I went into the remote viewing program and I'm glad I spent my time there because I think it was uh, much more important than uh, anything else I could have done while I was in Army Intelligence. Um, anyway, that's uh, pretty much it. We do have a few questions for you, Joe, as you can imagine. Yes. Um, a few, maybe. <laughs> I would... I would like you to start off with one of my favorite stories, which I have probably shared inaccurately over time, but I remember this from one of the sessions I did with you, where you talked about being asked to go and find something that was in a room at the back of a building somewhere in China. And when you came back, they didn't believe 
that you saw what you saw and you said you could rebuild. They didn't believe you understood what you saw. Do you remember that one? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I had uh, I had some gentlemen come to my house and uh, asked me to, and they were from intel an intelligence agency, and they asked me to uh, if I could do an out of body and find a certain building. And I said I can try. Um, this is a particularly difficult thing to do in the out of body condition because you get distracted by a lot of things. Um, but if I could find the building, I was supposed to go to a certain floor and there was a, uh, a vault type door on a room and in the room was a table with an object on it. And could I get to the object? And so I said, sure, certainly. Um, it took, I remember it took something like three and a half weeks for me to do that. I had numerous out of bodies. It was very difficult finding the building. Uh, they don't tell you where the building is. Uh, I eventually found what looked like the building and went to the right floor, uh, passed through the vault door and found an object sitting in the corner, like they had said. It's a very odd object, but I pushed my face into it and studied it in detail and then woke myself up and went into my drawing room and did some drawings, very detailed drawings, the best I could do anyway on this particular object. Rolled it up and put it in a tube and sent it to him. And it was about a month and I had two people come to my home and uh, ask uh, to talk to me about the thing that I had done. And I said, sure. And they came in and what they wanted to know was uh, where I had taken high energy physics. And I said, I had taken it nowhere. <laughs> I don't know anything about high energy physics. They said, uh, okay, um, who do you know that's a high energy physicist? And I said, I only know one physicist, that's Ed May. I worked with him for many years, but he's a low energy physicist. <laughs> I didn't even know there was a low energy physicist, but that's what Ed told me to, that he did. <laughs> And so they said, okay, um, where, where, uh, where do you check out your library books? And about that time, I was getting the idea that they didn't believe what I did. <laughs> so I gave them a list of the libraries that I have out here in the little country podunk area I live in. And, and uh, gave them letters so that they could go and check the books I had checked out, and which, which weren't many. And... Uh, so they did, and, and uh, uh, they, didn't, they didn't say anything, and they, they left. And so uh, I got angry about it. And so what I did is I thought about this, this object that I had drawn, and, and I thought, there's some things I can do to improve it. Um, I can, like, put it on uh, light fiber and uh, speed it up. And, uh, and I can use some better relays. Uh, they're faster and carried more energy. And so I went to the local electric company and got the, the part numbers for these, these uh, solenoid kind of switches that handle the big, you know, the huge uh, groups of lights they have over ballparks. Well, when you turn these big things on, they, they have to have a special switch. Otherwise, it would take out all the power in the city, you know, when it blows the fuse. So I use those switches and then I, I use those switches uh, interfaced with some light fiber and some other things that I got from Radio Shack, part numbers I got from Radio Shack, and re redesign this entire object. Only I, when I put it together in, in a drawing format, I made it about a third the size of the one that they had looked at. They wanted me to look at. And uh, I put that, rolled that up, put it in a tube and sent that to them. And a couple of guys showed up like within a day and came in and took all my writing material, all my paper, anything that I might have written through, you know, the pen, pencil or pinpoint would have pressed through. They tore the top off the drawing table, the leather top, and 
took everything and I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement to ever speak in detail about the device that I had drawn. I said, I guess you guys believe me now. Huh? <laughs> and uh, they went away and happy that I'm never going to talk about it. <laughs> you know, in detail anyway. Oh my God. That's one you're talking about, right? That's what I'm talking about. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Paul. Yeah, um, there's there a lot of great questions. Um, let's see, one of the questions actually that I have is, well, how do you find it, you know, the difference between doing this kind of work from an OBE state versus a remote viewing state? Um, when you go from, I think you talked about this a little, but it seems like if you're going fully out of body, are you able to get more details because you're, you're actually there seeing an object instead of just getting you know, impressions and details? You, you, can get, you can get what you can see or smell or hear, but you can't get anything beyond that in the out of body condition. Uh, you can't like, you can't get what somebody's thinking, but with remote viewing, you can. Remote viewing is much more open in terms of how much information you can derive from something. It's a lot faster too. You get in remote viewing, when you're describing the target, it's instantaneous. Uh, you don't have to hunt for it. It like pops right in your head. Uh, in the out-of-body condition, you have to hunt for whatever it is you're looking for. And there's a lot of distractions. In the out-of-body state, you can be moving towards the target you're after and pass by a, let's say, a really exotic uh, chandelier hanging off a ceiling or something and it just catches your attention and and that's uh out of body that's blown because you're going to spend a lot of time playing with the chandelier uh if you get my drift you know the same thing happens you might be distracted by a star and one you want to suddenly want to see it you got to see it you know and you wind up in the star it it, it it's very distracting the out of body condition because you're not used to the uh, the nearness of things um, or the direct the being able to directly go to something uh, that um, that amazes you or catches your your interest. Uh, so take and that and if you're looking for a particular building, it may take many out of bodies to find it. And so the work you have to do is enormous. And then when you get to the target area, you may have just, maybe I went to a table and got the wrong thing on a table. And I got to go back again and do it. And every time you do the out of body, it's, it's difficult because you have to go through the process of getting out of body. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, probably doesn't more times than not. Um, but the remote viewing is always instantaneous. You have access to everything. Everything's interconnected. Uh, you can jump from the actual target in a remote viewing to who made it. It could have been somebody halfway across the world. And you instantly jump to whatever they look like, that kind of thing. We have a couple of questions related to Mars. And one is... Has any of your earlier work on remote viewing portions of Mars impacted modern day revisits of overhead imagery or site selection for future rover missions and or on planet exploration projects? The only, the only thing that I know about that is the areas in which the targets lie that I did. The uh, to land something in those areas is extremely hazardous because of the chunks of rocks and uh, the many, many different things there that are hazardous to landing something. And so their preference is not to go to these places because their lander won't make it. In other words, they'll spend hundreds of millions of dollars building a lander and it just won't reach the, the place it'll arrive in pieces literally so 
they're afraid to go to the places that they're interested in even in many cases they it's uh they have committees that make decisions based on the capability the science capability of landing something on mars and they decide the most most preferable of the locations from just from a landing standpoint uh, versus a scientific collection standpoint. So that's the only thing, the only answer I've ever gotten, uh, which may or may not mean they'll ever land something there. You'd think they'd be interested in much of these things, many of these things, and I think they are. Um, even in uh, JPL, if you go into JPL and, and give them some of the, ge the geo locations for these uh, some of these objects, uh, they'll look at you and go, oh, that's the old city on Mars. And they'll turn around and give you the prints for it. You know, so they're even calling it the old city. So I don't, <laughs> you know, I, I think they're being truthful when they say there's a difficulty in landing, though. Uh, that may have a heavy impact on whether they go there or not. Got it. Thank you. Um, there's another one here asking about um, tips for gathering information when you have no monitor um, and then potentially using other states like like uh, trance states or dreams um, or other states for getting information by yourself. Uh, we we actually did experiments at Stanford uh, and we, we used the sleep lab, Stephen LaBerge's sleep lab at Stanford to do collection in a dream state because when you're in a dream state when you enter delta uh when you enter the delta state or the the actual dream state they know and can measure when that happens they can see sleep spindles that begin to occur and then they see the delta waves and they know that you're in deep deep delta and you're going into a dream state or you're in a dream state at the same time, there's a, there, you can learn to actually identify when you are dreaming and you're wide awake. So you're awake in the dream state and you can recognize when you are. And if you are good at that, you can actually signal them that you're in the dream state and awake and aware. And the way you do that is you stand perfectly still in your dream uh, like if you're riding a bike, you get off the bike and you stand perfectly straight up and down and you turn left and right over your shoulder like this four times very rapidly. And what happens is on the, one, of the, the, one of the delta rolls, you'll see on the, on the graph, you'll see little spikes appear, uh, four little spikes. And that's because of the muscle configurations in the eyes. Uh, tells them that you are awake and aware and you're in the dream state and they can then produce a target for you and you can go to the target and uh, work the target it, it's hard to describe how you get to the target though because if you're in the dream state and you're riding a bicycle down a gravel road you haven't got a clue where the lab is or where the target is or any of that so what I decided what I would do is I would just close my eyes in the dream and click my heels together and open my eyes and I'd be standing in the, in the target and that worked. So I would spend time walking around in the target and then draw it as accurately as I could. And uh, I did that seven times and many of them were exact, exactly drawn the way the target was. Um, what happens, the difficulty is that uh, maintaining the sleep and doing that is difficult. Uh, after a while, when you've done two or three of these back to back, you start having what's called a false awakening. That's where you give the signal the second time and they're supposed to come and wake you up. And uh, they do, they wake you up and you draw the target and you talk into a, uh, a tape machine and describe it and all these things. And then suddenly you realize when the color of the walls keeps changing that you're still in the dream state. That's called a false awakening. Well, I've been 
in the, those experiments, I went through a false awakening, uh, I think uh, seven or eight times where I couldn't wake myself up you know, or have them wake me up. And I started to panic because you start thinking this must be what it's like to be crazy or insane as you live in an altered state all your time and nobody else understands what that is. Um, but I, eventually I did awake and it, we discussed it and what we came to was an agreement that we wouldn't do the experiments anymore to that degree because uh, somebody without a strong, uh, a strong understanding for their mental state would probably have a psychotic break. And that would be terrible to have happened to somebody. So we stopped doing the experiments, but they were very accurate from a remote viewing standpoint. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm a remote, i uh, sorry. I'm a lucid dreamer myself. So I've had that experience or I've actually been to a physical place and then looked it up and it's exactly as it was. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's incredible um, that you can use that state in that way. But um, yeah. I also have a false awakening and that does get, you know, that can get, can get it a little unraveling, uh, you know, if it happens several times mm -hmm. in a row. Yeah. Anything else, Susan? Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute, Susan. Susan, yeah, you're muted. Unmute. Mute. There, there we, we go. go. Okay. Um, when you describe the state of imagination of what you see in your head, or sorry, probably would you describe it as similar to what you see in your mind's eye or in reading a book? Do you feel like this mental state can be applied to other capacities besides RV, such as drive the process of search rescue from another state as an amplifier for what you're studying? Not sure I understood the question, but um, it de it depends on how good the remote viewing is. Uh, one of the problems is uh, anybody can just imagine something, uh, but the imagine the imagination doesn't necessarily produce an accurate picture of the target. Uh, sometimes people imagine something and they imagine something entirely different than what the target actually is. That is actually the case for most people. Uh, we have done numerous studies on who, who produces accurate remote viewings as compared to non-accurate remote viewings. And it looks like about 1% of any population can produce extremely good remote viewing. And it just doesn't get any better than that, 1%. Uh, so because you want to be a remote viewer doesn't necessarily mean you will be. But that's not a bad thing uh, because disciplining the mind is still of great benefit. It's hugely beneficial to anyone. The the fact that somebody can't remote view is no worse than somebody saying, I want to learn how to bowl and then being asked, they learn to bowl. And then immediately somebody says, well, can you bowl three perfect games in a row? And you know, how many people can do that? About 1% of the population. So nobody gets angry when they, can't bowl three perfect games, but a lot of people get really angry when they're told they can't remote view well. I don't, I don't understand that personally, but um, if I had to do it all over again, I would rather study remote viewing than be a remote viewer. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, from a reputational standpoint, it's extremely uh, invasive. Uh, once I developed a reputation as a remote viewer, I was dealing suddenly with senators and congressmen and generals and admirals and people who wanted to prove that I was just simply lying through my teeth. Mm -hmm. And you, if you're not a, if you don't have a strong belief in your capability, uh, forget it. It'll trash you completely. Um, I, the biggest, the person who has disagreed about me more than any other human being on the planet was our Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates. 
the man said I was nothing but a fantasizer every time anybody brought me up to him. And yet, when I saw him in, in cafeterias in Washington, if I went up to shake his hand, he ran out of the room. He's terrified of me. Mm. Um, I mean, that's nuts. That's nuts. Not, not the remote feeling. Um, so you have to have a strong constitution to deal with remote viewing at all. Um, it's problematic. Yeah, I can imagine. Nobody's prepared for it. Yeah. Uh, a question that I had for you is, is um, you know, with the Project Stargate being shut down, do you imagine that it was just moved somewhere else? I know this is probably speculation, but do you think there's still active programs going on with remote viewing in, in the U.S. government? Well, it's always a possibility, but I don't think so. And I'll tell you why I don't think so. It takes money and they won't spend the money on it. Secondarily to that, uh, it uh, if you're going to start another project, you'd want to have the benefit of 35 years, um, well, 40, 43 years of research and experience in dealing with it you know, the science behind it to help you not rebuild the wheel or make the same mistakes. And that's possessed by two people on the planet. That's me and Dr. May. And no one has ever come and asked us for that, mm. ever. So I don't think so. I don't think it's happening or going on. I think there's a lot of people that tried it. I know that, uh, you know, there are different governments that have tried it, but the people that tried it went in with the intention of dumping it anyway, because they didn't want to be dealing with it. Mm. So you, you can see the erroneousness of their experiments. You, I can tell you the invalidity of their efforts right from the get-go, the mistakes they made. And then they come out and say, well, we've tried it and it doesn't work. Well, that's because they were stupid. You know, <laughs> well, those of us at Monroe who have benefited from your courses are delighted that you've brought that information to us because we very, very definitely believe you. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> so I think, uh, yeah, I think we're about out of time. Um, uh, thank you so much, Joe, for being with us. Uh, it's fascinating. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you guys for being here. It's a good place. Thank you. Thank you.